Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have with me a very, very special guest. It's an investor who I truly respect. Uh, his name is Serging. Uh, he was a writer from Motley Fool and you know, I've read his, he's an investment blogger himself and his views and his thoughts and his investment approach is bar none, one of the best I've ever seen out in the market here today in Singapore, right? And I, I really, really want to get his thoughts on, you know, the entire COVID situation and the entire market declines. So, you know, I'm going to dig deep into his brain. So let's find out you know, how he thinks about the whole situation and, and uh, hopefully he can give you some gems and pieces of advice which can help you in your investing journey, especially right now. All right. So welcome, Serging. Thank you for doing this interview together with me. Hey, no, thanks, Fresh, for, for having me. And I, I think you're too kind um, about describing like my investment philosophy and thoughts. I'm just a simple guy who wants to share about uh, what I've known about uh, investing to, to the public. Yeah. Guys, I just want to give you some context about me and Serging, right? So... You know, so, uh, I, I, I started my investing journey, I think, back quite, quite some time ago. And, you know, Serging was one of the first few guys who I actually got to know as a, you know, really, really solid investor. And, you know, I, since then, obviously, I've grown a lot. He's grown in his journey as well. But, you know, he is one guy who I will never forget. He said this one word to me. You know, when I started out, I was fresh, I was green, I was 18 years old. And he told me, Rash, uh, I don't know whether you remember this, Serging, but he told me, this, he said, Rash, Bond. you know, you look back uh, when you move forward in the next three years to five, in like three years to five years time, you look back and see how powerful investing as a vehicle is, right? And, you know, he asked me to really look long term and see the fruits of my labor in the next three to five years. And, you know, every single time I look back at my investing journey, that has been so true. And, you know, thank you for putting that perspective, man. You know, it really, really helped me. And I will never forget that one sentence you said to me, man. That's, that's so awesome. Thanks for sharing. I mean, I, I, I cannot remember that, that yeah. conversation, but I'm glad that I actually said something like that. Actually, the message that you just shared is something that I always tell um, people that I come across, my friends, my family, um, yeah, people that I meet on the streets um, or anywhere. Yeah, that's the message that I always tell them that like, you know, with investing, we've got to think long term. And then five to seven years from now, when you look back, then you actually realize how powerful the concept of uh, long term investing is. Fantastic, man. Dude, okay, so tell me, man, you know, right now with mm -hmm. the entire COVID situation, uh, what are your points of view? Do you think this would lead mm -hmm. to a further decline? You know, what should investors mm -hmm. be doing to prepare? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, tell me your thoughts. Yeah, so I think first it's very important to uh, note that I, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. Um, even like the medical experts are have, cannot come to a consensus as to how severe uh, COVID-19 will be. Uh, or uh, when COVID-19 will end. I mean, some medical experts have said that high temperatures and, and the, the, um, the arrival of uh, like summer months uh, in some of the affected countries would kind of like effectively kill off the disease by natural means. That's the view of some medical experts. Some have said that, you know, that's not probably not going to be the case. Um, and I've actually seen um, news articles on leaked, um, like reports from top medical officials in the US um, asking there are hospitals to actually prepare for very large scale, like uh, rates of infection and, and rates of death. So it's, I, I think it's really anybody's guess as to what's going to happen to, to um, uh, in terms of like how COVID-19 is going to develop. And, in term, and then that in turn will actually determine how severe the, the economic uh, outcomes will be. But I think if you look back at history, we can see that there have also been really severe outbreaks of um, diseases that have happened in the past and stocks have actually done really well um, over time, um, like I think I can count easily more than 10 um, like severe disease outbreaks that have happened over the past like uh, 30 or 50 years. I think, you know, like today, HIV is, is, is it's a very serious disease, but it's something that people understand um, very well now. But back then, uh, when it first um, happened, there was a lot of widespread hysteria and panic over the disease as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we can go back to more recent history. There was SARS, there was H1N1 in 2009. You know, all these um, various things. And of course, like, you know, um, we have seen very severe uh, downturns in, in markets over the past few weeks. Uh, but I think it's also important for investors to realize that market downturns can happen for all kinds of reasons. It can happen for economic weakness. It can happen for, you know, <laughs> really no, no, no reason at all. Like if we go back to, like, say, um, I've seen this, this, this really beautiful statistic from Morgan Housel, who used to write for the Mollifu. He's now with this uh, venture capital firm called Collaborative Fund. Um, Morgan had an article many years ago that looked at um, the percentage of uh, uh, how frequent the S&P 500 had declined um, from peak to trial um, uh, going back to 1928. So from 1928 to 2013, he looked at like 
market statistics and realized that you know on average the market declines by 10 percent on top to bottom every 11 months on average um there's a 20 percent decline once every two years or so 30 percent decline um, once every five to ten years and then a 50 percent decline two to three times per century so what this shows is that and, and the amazing thing is that from 1928 to 2013 the s p 500 in the us has actually increased by 21000 percent in total you know um after you include dividends and inflation um, and so you, you look at the frequency of uh, like severe declines in the S and P five hundred over that period, and yet you have seen you know the market actually rise by a huge amount over that time. And I think that is the most important thing that people need to realize that you know declines happen frequently for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it is something that the the markets do um, as to and and you know like you ask me um, what's going to happen from here. You know, is there, are there like further declines? Yeah, I mean. There's always the possibility that sharper declines can happen. There's also always the possibility that you know a, a sharp rebound can happen from here. The thing is, no one knows. But also importantly, I think that shouldn't that shouldn't change at all as to um, that. Okay, I cannot speak for everyone, but that does not change how I actually invest. I've been investing for um, nearly ten years now, and my approach has always been to find um, great companies with bright long-term prospects and I invest in them. I look for companies with strong balance sheets, recurring revenue, strong free cash flows. Um, capable management teams with integrity. And if I find them, I like them, I invest in them. And that has been my approach. Um, I, you know, um, uh, uh, just earlier today, uh, uh, a friend of mine um, commented on a Facebook post that I made and, and, and mentioned that, um, and he's a dear friend of mine, he mentioned that, you know, today um, investors without holding power should be investing more cautiously. And I completely agree. But I also responded and said that, you know, it's always a time to invest cautiously, but how do we invest cautiously, right? We invest cautiously by finding, by buying really good quality companies uh, at, at reasonable prices. And also very crucially, you know, we invest with capital that we do not need for like at least five years. You know, if we invest with short-term capital, we are, we are put in a position where we could be forced to sell. Now that is one of the worst things that can happen um, to investors. So, um, yeah, that's a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, interestingly, um, you know, talking about this, right? Um, I get, let me give you an example of a stock. So recently, mm. one, of my, uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, we had a conversation and he invested in Occidental, right? I, I'm sure you're aware of Occidental, Warren Buffett's... Uh, Occidental Petroleum? Yes, yes. On. Okay. Right, so he invested in Occidental Petroleum and, you know, yesterday with the entire oil price decline as well, with oil prices dropping 30%, you know, his cost has went down as if he bought it. His average cost was about $40 and it's gone down to what, $16 or so, right? So he's like, oh shit. Like, you know, I didn't expect the whole decline to happen. And, you know, this was sharp and huge and he owns and it's about 20% of his portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So he's actually asking me like, dude, like, what should I do, right? Should I actually be keeping and just holding on to the stock and waiting however long for it to recover, right? What should my game plan be? Should I actually sell it so I can redeploy it to some better companies? Um, yeah, so what would you, what would your advice be to uh, that, that guy? So I think first, um, the friend of yours um, should be looking at his investment thesis and determine, you know, in the first place, why had he invested in Occidental Petroleum? Uh, because if one of the key assumptions is that, you know, he or she uh, uh, is able to um, predict our prices, then um, I think that that fundamental assumption should be uh, relooked at. Um, I know I personally not really. Um, I'm not have never really been interested in companies that are um, really linked to commodities, simply because I have no idea how uh, the prices of commodities uh, will move. And and the thing is, commodity related companies, um, the revenues of them tend to be linked to the movements of commodity prices. And this creates an issue because if you know if you're unable to predict the prices of commodities, then it's really difficult for you to get a good grasp on how well or how poorly. Um, a particular company will do, you know, if it's linked to commodity prices. So I think um, in, in, in your friend's case, you know, it's, it's really, um, does your friend have a good handle on, on um, the movement of oil prices? I, I know I don't, uh, so I've never really been interested in investing um, in oil and gas companies for many years. Um, so yeah, I think that's something your friend really uh, has, has to look at. So, you know, see, this is the issue, right? With, with new investors, uh, great. Like, you know, he told me that rest not, no, I'm not in the oil and gas industry. I don't really know oil and gas myself, right? So, all right. So if that's his answer, then would, would your advice be, okay, cool. Then in that case, move on, cut your losses, redeploy the capital somewhere better. Or would it be uh, maybe, 
would hold on for a bit, let it recover. Like, what would you, what would you say? Um, okay, so like you've got to take my answer with the caveat that sure. I cannot be financial advice or investment okay. advice of any form. But um, what I think investors should always be doing in general is that you know if they have made a, if they've realized that they've made a, a huge mistake in their investment thesis, um, then like I think the, the the better move would be to actually um, cut their losses and and move on. Um, you know, you don't have to make back your money in the same company. You know, you can always take a lump with um, like that Occidental has um, delivered. Use that capital and, and invest in another company with much better prospects. You know, I have a friend of mine um, who uh, was, I think, down like 80% or something during the financial crisis in one company, um, but he spotted a much better opportunity, took the money out and he made 10 times his money on that, on the, when he made the switch. Right, and then so that, that 10x gain in the new company actually um, more, made up, more than made up for the 80% loss in the previous company. Mm, so, beautiful. yeah, I, I think it's always important to, to you know, realize when um, re, um, to, to cut our losses if we actually realize that we've made a very big mistake in, in terms of how we actually formed our investment thesis in the first place. Yeah, dude, I think that's something that many people struggle with, right? Like, you know, there's this saying that people uh, hold on to their losses and cut their winners, right? When they have yeah, yeah. I mean, they, yeah, the phrase that I like to use uh, that, uh, is that people like to water their weeds and cut their flowers. Yeah. So, like, I mean, since we brought this up, right, like a, a core tenet of my portfolio management philosophy is that I, um, if I'm forced to sell, the yeah. first companies I'm, that I will be looking to sell will be companies that I define as losers and how I define them will actually be companies whose businesses have not performed as well as I had um, imagined when I first invested in them. Um, so, yeah, I'm always looking out to cut my, my losers and actually allow my, my winners to continue growing. I mean, one of the, there's this like a um, slightly counterintuitive point of view. You know, when you look at any financial or, or any um, financial media, they always say that past performance is not good an indicator of the future, right? But actually, I think it is actually a performance. At least it's actually a pretty solid indicator um, in a sense that because winning companies tend to have momentum that keep on winning, right? And um, so if you actually find a company that continues to win, that has been winning, then chances are that it can continue winning. Of course, we, we can be wrong. Um, but, you know, um, when you find companies with winning this momentum, then you know, um, it's always uh, good to... Um, um, let them continue being in your portfolio and continue for the ride. I mean, like investors often see a company that has gone up like 5x or 10x in value and think yeah, I completely missed the boat. But you know, let's, if you look at say like Amazon, which uh, my family owns, um, you know, it's from its IPO at about, I think one or something. Today it's up, um, today it's like thousand dollars. So it's up, I, I don't know how many times I can't do the math. <laughs> but you know, um, at one point in time, Amazon had to be up by x had to be up by 20x, had to, had to be up by 30x. But, you can invest in it, you have still done very well over the long run. And the reason is because Amazon continued to win as a business. Yeah. Fantastic. Dude, can you, uh, can you share with us mm -hmm. uh, some examples where you had, you know, you had to cut the weeds, right? Like where you actually made mm -hmm. an investment thesis that was wrong. And maybe you can share light mm -hmm. on that story so people can actually learn from experience. Sure. I actually, funny you brought this up because I'm actually currently in the process of writing an article for my blog on describing some of my biggest losers. Um, but two, two of these biggest losers will actually be, funnily enough, oil and gas companies. One of them will be Edward Oceanics, which got privatized a few years ago. The other will be um, National Oil Well Varco. So I think the, the, the real mistake I made, made back then, I invested in them in 2010, and I think I sold them somewhere in 2014 or 15 somewhere along those lines. Um, and ever since then, I, they were the only oil and gas companies that I actually bought. I've, ever since then, I've never bought any other companies. Or I, In fact, I've not bought any other commodity-related companies. It goes back to the point I made earlier about the discussion we had about Aussie, right? That, you know, um, if you're investing in a company that's related to commodities, you really have to be, um, have, have a good grasp on the, the price of the commodity that is uh, backing that company's business fundamentals. And I saw it when I realized that, you know, I really have no capability or ability to predict uh, the movement of oil prices. Uh, so I, I decided that, like, you know, they, they were not a good, uh, not good fit for my portfolio. And from a more, what do you call it, uh, slightly less monetary perspective, I actually also, so, so um, the Motley Fool's co-founder, David Gardner, has a beautiful, um, like, uh, phrase to describe um, how he constructs his portfolios. And, and, and he says that, you know, make your, make your portfolio um, the 
according to the vision you have for, for, for the future. So like in, in, in my idealized uh, worldview, like, you know, there's very little room for, for, for fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels pollute the environment um, and uh, we do need cleaner energy. So from, from that perspective as well, I decided that, you know, I didn't want to be a part of the futures of uh, oil and gas companies. And that was the reason why I sold. I think I'm down something like, uh, uh, fifth, between 50 to 80% uh, on, on, on my positions with Edward Oceanics and National Oil of Arco. So I sold them after the price of oil collapsed uh, in, in mid-2014. Mm, interesting, interesting. You know, I just wanted to share, okay, so let's say, uh, you know, I know one of the companies mm-hmm. you're investing in besides uh, um, Amazon is Mercado Libre, for example, right? Your yep. Western yep. company, right? So brilliant yes. company, you know, absolutely amazing. You know, so yesterday, we saw prices coming down. Yesterday, Mercado's price dropped nearly 12%. So the thing is, you know, nothing changes the fact that it's a great business will continue to grow. You know, I, I totally am with you on that. But how do you deploy your cash, man? Like, you know, what's your, what's your philosophy in that? Uh, are you going to, let's say, for example, if it's down 12% yesterday, will you, will you enter again or will you wait for, you know, further declines? What's your approach? Um, so I think the approach uh, first has to be on, um, okay, so in terms of capital deployment, I, I think that um, people should be adopting a portfolio level type of approach. And so it's not a matter of like just chasing prices down, but it's also a matter of like, okay, how big is this company already in my portfolio, if I were to inject new capital into the portfolio and I buy shares of this company that's smaller, will it become too heavy a portion of my portfolio? So I think that's the question that everybody needs to ask. The, the threshold is always different for everyone. Personally, I wouldn't, would never let a company be 20% or more of my um, portfolio. Um, uh, and you know, like with a company like Mercado Libre, it's fantastic. It's, it, I think it's a phenomenal company with one of the best management teams that I've seen. But even, but even so, it's actually operating in um, a really tough uh, environment and that's Latin America like you know politics and the economy there um, they are not the most stable um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in that area um, and so so to Mercado Libre's credit it has done really well but even then that's a, that's a risk to note right so in, in that case like you know we've got to think um, do I want a very large portion of my portfolio to be tied to a company that is um, generating revenues in one of the most volatile regions around the world. So, so I think that's a, a, um, a question that people uh, have to answer. Um, it's, not, it's not something that, um, I, don't, I don't think there's a one size uh, fit all kind of answer. So in my case personally, I think Mercado Libre is like five or 6% of my portfolio. And I think that is a very comfortable size uh, that I have. And, and so you know, even if it drops 12%, I, I probably wouldn't be willing to add to it because if I were to add, add capital to it um, no, and it grows to like 7 or 8%, then, um, then I don't think that makes a lot of sense. But that said, right, like if, if Mercado Libre is actually growing, uh, its business as in, as in its weightage in my portfolio increases because the share price has risen, then that's a different story. So um, yeah, I wouldn't want to deploy capital in the companies and, and push up their weightage in my portfolio to a level that I'm not comfortable with. Mm-hmm. But if, you know, if the share price has actually risen over a long period of time, and allow comp- and make that company a much heavier weight in my portfolio, then I'll be comfortable with that because then that's proof, you know, that um, the company's uh, uh, heavy weight in my portfolio is a matter of um, underlying business growth. And this is also like related to the point I made earlier about watering our flowers and cutting our weeds. Mm, interesting, interesting. And so, so again, if I got you correctly, mm-hmm. you basically said that 20%, mm-hmm. that's the max you will go with any one given position. At any part of time, yeah. So that's yes, yes, that's uh, but that yeah, but that's that's just me, right? And, and mm-hmm. everyone has a different portfolio um, allo- uh, allocation, like um, so, um, yeah. So if you see. don't, dude, if you don't mind sharing, right? So mm-hmm. with regards to portfolio management, with regards to how you do it, again, like I like we have already clarified, different investors do it in different ways. But what's your approach, man? You know, how many companies do you generally keep in portfolio? What do you think is a, a size which you are comfortable with in terms of monitoring, in terms of understanding? Yeah, how many do you actually have in your portfolio? You know, this is also a really interesting um, discussion because, uh, like, you know, there are some investors like Charlie Munger, for example, yeah. who swears by, you know, concentrating his, I think Charlie Munger's personal portfolio is like one third in Costco, one third in Berkshire, and one third in uh, this uh, Himalaya Capital, which is this uh, investment fund run by Li Lu. And it's uh, investing mostly in, I think, Chinese and, and Korean equities. Um, so yeah, that's a, like a super concentrated um, portfolio. But on the other hand, you know, you have like Peter Lynch who, who did tremendously. Well. And I, I, I think when Peter Lynch retired, he had like 1,400 stocks in his yep. portfolio. So, you know, you have this huge disparity there. 
and and then you know in the middle you have like Walter Schloss who who is who um who passed away a few years ago and and Schloss was a good friend of uh, Warren Buffett. I was also a uh, employee of Benjamin Graham, just like Warren Buffett. Um, and and when Schloss was running his own fund for like forty years, um, forty over years, he he always held like I think like hundred to two hundred stocks at any point in time. So you know there's this really wide range of um different opinions about, you know, what's the right level of, uh, you know, should people be concentrated or should people be diversified? Um, I think in, in, there are investors that have done very well with either approaches. So again, it's really boils down to like the individual, what kind of investor uh, he or she is, you know, is she comfortable with like having a very concentrated portfolio or, or is he or she, you know, comfortable with a uh, like more diversified one. Personally, um, my, my family's portfolio, the one that I've run um, has about more than 50 companies um, in, in it. It's all in the US. Um, but I think the top 10 stocks make up maybe something like 40% or 50% of the, of the portfolio. So, you know, it's, con it's diversified by name, but concentrated in, uh, in, in terms of weightage. Yeah. So again, you know, no one size fit all answer, but that's just my, my personal approach. Interesting. Interesting. Dude, you know, uh, Sergei, over the years, I'm sure mm. you've diversified as an investor yourself. You know, I've, re I've read your articles like religiously over the years. Like I think you've published like thousands of articles. So, you know, I'm very, I'm quite familiar with the companies they've invested in, companies that you've kind of lost money in, made money from, made plenty of money from. So, um, you know, um, let me just bring up one from memory. So you mentioned like last time you made a mistake uh, in like Dolby. Remember Dolby? Right. Adobe laboratory, yeah. right. yep. Adobe, right? So the yeah, Adobe, for example. So you know, with regards to your own investing approach, do you generally prefer going for companies like uh, Amazon and Mercados, or do you prefer like uh, Adobe, which is you know Adobe or Edward, which is more of a small cap, mid cap? So how has your investing approach evolved as you've actually matured as an investor, and would you shed, shed some light on that? Um, I so. I had, so I actually started investing in, I started learning about investing when I was maybe uh, 17 or 18 years old. Yeah. Um, that was when I, I, I and I uh, first came across investing through Philip Fisher's book, uh, that would be Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. Mm. Uh, that, that, that really, you know, that book, I, every, most of the ideas that Fisher wrote, I, I find really logical. So that has really been sort of like the, the um, a very strong um, influence in terms of how I uh, have been thinking about investing from like the very first day that I knew about the stock market and investing. Um, so I've always adopted a very business uh, focused uh, approach to investing. Um, but what I've changed uh, over the years is that I have come to appreciate a lot more about quality of management. Um, one interesting evolution in the way I think about investing is that, you know, so, so there, um, a lot of investors can talk about competitive advantages. And then they list down, um, like um, I think Dorsey, from, who used to be at Morningstar, now is an asset management firm. He wrote this really good book um, about competitive advantages. And he lists down a few like what network effects, um, um, pricing power, um, and, and a few others that I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but they were all, you know, like they were big things that you could kind of um, look out for in the company and then you can classify but I think all, but over the years I think ultimately what I've realized is that all of these competitive advantages that you can identify in a company they all stem from um, management and so I and now I see management as like the ultimate source of competitive advantage because a company's current competitive advantage uh, comes from actions that management has done in the past and a company's future competitive advantage will be um, a result of what management is doing today. So I, 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 I spend a lot of time just um, thinking about uh, companies' management team um, a lot more than I uh, used to in the past. Uh, I think about how they have grown the business, how they view the business, how they view competition, um, and how they have executed. Uh, how are they incentivized? So these are things that I, I look at a lot with uh, management teams. Uh, in, and, and if uh, you read, uh, if I've um, actually looked at my blog, um, when I discuss actual companies that are owned in my family's portfolio, uh, you'll notice that I think the long, by far the, the, the longest um, um, pieces of, uh, I mean, the longest discussion in that article would actually be on the company's management team because that's where I spend a lot of time um, thinking about and, and finding information on. So I think that has been like the, the, a very big shift. Now you also put out that, you know, like, do I like to look for like small caps or meat caps, right? So um, my... My approach is that I'm actually market cap agnostic. I don't really care what the size of the company is. It's more important that a company is able to 
um, excel against the few criteria that I've looked at. This is something that I mentioned in my blog, and uh, there are six things that I tend to look out for in a company. So very quickly, right? First is that I want companies that have uh, that are operating in large and or growing markets. So basically, the company must be operating in a field that's able to grow uh, over the long run. Um, I want strong balance sheets. Uh, you know, uh, typically I want uh, more cash than debt. If there's debt, then I want strong recurring free cash flows that um can sort of outweigh the debt. Third, I want management teams with integrity, capability, and ability to innovate. Uh, the fourth thing is I look out for is uh, I want companies with high levels of recurring revenues, either through customer behavior or contracts. Uh, and then um, I also want uh, companies with a proven track record of growth. And then lastly, I want companies whose business model excuse me, makes me think that they are able to um, generate a strong free cash flow in the future. So as long as a company can actually meet these characteristics, I'm happy to, to, to invest in them uh, regardless of the size. Mm, interesting, interesting. Dude, thanks for sharing that, man. And you know, um, okay, okay. So I, I get it, right? Yeah, I get how you mm -hmm. how you see the entire thing. But you know, I have this one mm -hmm. nagging question in my head. You know, when you talk about management team, right? Like, mm -hmm. how does a beginning investor kind of assess management team? What are some quick few tips you can give them with regards to assessing management? Because that's something that you know we kind of don't have access to, right? As a retail investor. So how how do you do that yourself? Um, okay, so in let's talk about access to, to management teams first, right? So I think um, um, if you're talking about, say, companies that are listed in Asia in general, then I think, yes, it's true that you know, um, most individual investors cannot really gain access uh, to them. But for these in some of the, more, the larger exchanges around the world, then I think access isn't really a problem because um, like, especially if you're talking about US listed companies, you know, they have a lot of like investor presentations, they have um, transcripts of like their earnings calls, they have, uh, they do a lot of interviews in, in, in television as well as in, in print form. So there's a lot of inf information that we can actually um, find out about a company's management team without actually having to meet them. And if you're talking about like companies that are listed in um, large exchanges like in the US, right? So um, that's the, um, um, what I have to say about access, but it's also in, in terms of like being able to um, like sort of uh, um, evaluate teams, I think uh, it's really, so, so there are two sides to it, right? There's like the, there's like the um, quantitative side, and then there's also the qualitative side. So the quantitative side, I think it's, uh, um, you don't really need like experience or, or there's no real subject in it, um, but you know, you can look for things, a few things that, I tend to look out for first how is management incentivized if the information is available. So like a lot of companies in the US, um, they file this thing called a proxy form or DEF 14A. This form um, tells you um, how the management team is incentivized. Um, like they share some of the key the the, the key performance matrix that a, that the management team eat before they are paid. So you know you look out for things that you look out for performance matrix that makes sense to you shareholder. Like, you know, if a management team is compensated based on just revenue growth, I'll be worried because, you know, you can very easily boost revenue growth, but make a huge mess of the company's um, profits and growth and balance sheet, right? But, you know, if a company is compensated based on, say, free cash flow per share um, or, like, earnings per share or book value per share, then that gives, or that gives me a lot more um, confidence in terms of, like, uh, the integrity of the management team. Then we can, we can also look at, say, the absolute amount of compensation the management team has actually earned over time compared to the business performance. You know, um, um, the, has the compensation actually increased together with the business performance or has compensation actually increased while business performance is declining? You know, mm -hmm. if, if the case of compensation rising while performance is declining, then that is really bad because then it's, uh, to me, it's a yellow flag because I see that as a sign that, you know, this is a management team that doesn't really um, it's not actually treating shareholders, right? And then another quantitative thing we can look at is like related party transactions. So related party transactions are transactions that the listed company makes with companies or entities that are linked to its management team. So I think a, um, an example that I mentioned in my blog is actually Haiti Lao, right? So it's a company that I think most people in Singapore will be familiar with. You know, Haiti Lao is the, the operator of this very popular hot pot restaurant. Mm. Um, in 2018, I think uh, the, the four out of Haiti Lao's top five suppliers actually were controlled by Haiti Lao's management. And um, of these top five suppliers, uh, I think they accounted for something like 30% or more of the total um, like cost of goods sold um, 
that Haiti Lao um, paid for in, in, during the year. So, you know, with such high levels of related party transactions, there's always the opportunity or chance that Haiti Lao's uh, management could be playing games with the company shareholders. But if we look back um, in terms of, uh, like, if you look at Haiti Lao's profit margins, you realize that they're actually pretty healthy for a restaurant operator. They're somewhere around like 9 or 10% going back to like 2016. Um, so, you know, when you look at that, then you think that mm, yeah, maybe uh, even, though there's, uh, even though the optics don't really look too good, but if you dig deeper, then you realize that actually things look fine. So, you know, um, these are the quantitative things that I look at. Like in terms of the qualitative things, then, you know, this is where, uh, this is very subjective. This is where a lot of um, judgment will come into play. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a silver bullet to fix this uh, judgment issue. Um, but what I can share in terms of like how I, some of the things, interesting things that I look out for, right? So like um, I mentioned earlier about, you know, I like to look at how management thinks about competition. So let's talk about Netflix, which is um, a company that I've owned for many years and it has done really well for my family's portfolio. So, you know, Raj, if I were to ask you, like, um, if you were to think of uh, competition for Netflix, right? What comes in, um, what pops up in your head? Disney Plus. Disney Plus. Um, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, other streaming services, am I right? Yep. Right. So that would be the first like thing you think about when you think about competition on Netflix. But actually, management views competition very differently. Mm. So basically, right, any time that an individual is um is Yep. So, um, you know, with regards to, to Netflix, I think one of the really interesting things that about what management has said in the past is that, you know, every, any time that an individual is spent not watching Netflix, that is competition. So, like, you know, if you're exercising, if you're reading a book, if you're playing music, if you're listening to music, if you're going for a walk, anything, that is competition. Right? And I think that, you know, having this really interesting, correct, um, wide view of competition, um, says a lot about, I think, the quality of the management team because having this kind of view actually, um, I think, in my opinion, lessens the risk that Netflix can be blindsided by competition because it's so, um, it's able to, you know, really just um, have a very wide view of competition and, and, and when you have a very wide view of competition, then you tend to build your business in a way that can actually fend off all of these competitive forces, right? Mm -hmm. That's just uh, one, like, qualitative example. Um, two more, right? Um, one, I think it would be like if you look at Costco, which I sadly don't own shares of. I, I, I've looked at the company for many years ago and it's a company that I admire a lot. Um, and, and I just mentioned, right, that Charlie Munger owns a big chunk in Costco. So Costco is famous for actually, um, you know, marking up the... So, okay, Costco is actually a, a warehouse retailer. So it's kind of like NTUC or, or like a, a, a supermarket or something. But instead of... Uh, it runs its stores in huge warehouses and to enter the, its stores, you actually have to purchase a membership and interestingly, Costco actually earns most of its profits and cash flows from these membership fees. And um, it actually marks up the cost of goods, right, by a very slim margin of between 13 to 15%. Um, and so what happens, the goods that Costco sells in its warehouse stores, uh, the extra markup just there to pay for fees, salaries, and, and interest expenses, and some of the other operational stuff. And at the bottom line, if you're talking about just selling the goods alone, it's like nearly zero. And then its profits really just come from um, the membership fees that, that uh, members pay. Now, what's really interesting is that Costco is adamant about sticking to this mark markup of 13 to 15 percent. And and there was this story, amazing story. Like there was once a um, a Costco purchasing manager was actually um, you know it was working with a supplier and managed to bring down the price of of a product say from twenty dollars to ten dollars. So like this supplier could actually manufacture the same product using ten dollars instead of twenty dollars in the past with the help of the Costco manager. Now I think, and when that was achieved, right, you know what was amazing? So at a $20 cost price, um, Costco could be selling the product for, um, let's say at a 15%, then that would be something like um, $20, $25, yeah. right? So, but instead of keeping the selling price at 25, Costco lowered its selling price to like 11 or $12 in, in keeping with its uh, traditional markup. And the reason it was doing so is because it, Costco always wants to pass on cost savings to its investors. Now that seems like a very simple thing to do, right? Like you know, we can we can just tell uh, Walmart or or, or UC or whatever, hey, just mark up your cost, just mark up your goods by like thirteen to fifteen percent. But but seemingly simple thing actually goes directly against hum human um, greed, right? We are all greedy in certain ways, 
And this, what Costco is doing actually goes directly against that. But what it also creates is this really strong competitive advantage. And, and um, Costco has actually stuck to its principle of uh, marking up this goods by very low margin um, for, 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 for many, many years. And I uh, hope that it will continue doing so. so the second example. The third example is like um, Amazon. Uh, much like Costco, Amazon has a really laser-like focus on, on, on um, serving its customers well. Um, like an example, right? Like in 2003 or 2005, um, Bezos actually introduced a, 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 um, a feature in Amazon where it will actually remind customers that you've actually purchased this product just a few weeks ago. Are you sure you want to do it again? So, you know, from a, from, from, from most of that, for most of us, like if a customer buy like a CD that he has purchased a few weeks ago, we'd be like, I mean, you know, what's the harm, you know, uh, we get to earn more money and they remember. So like, let's let him do it. But in Jeff Bezos' view, that, you know, this is bad for customer experience and for us to remind the customers that is great customer experience. And so he went ahead with that. And again, you know, that is, that is something that is not usual. Most companies wouldn't do it. And so um, I think that is like, uh, this, uh, like three good examples of like the qualitative things that I look out for in management teams. I don't really have like a very um, like clear or well thought out articulation of, of uh, what I look out for in terms of being, evaluating management. But I hope like the examples I've shared would be able to give people a better sense of how I, I, I look at things. Mm. Dude, okay. So now, uh, thank mm-hmm. you for sharing that, man. You know, gave me a lot of insight into what to look at, you know. And um, searching, so I have uh, two main questions mm-hmm. before we wrap up the interview. And the first question I want to ask is this, right? Um, okay, coming back to the whole COVID-19 situation, um, what companies do you think will be possibly a lot, like very, very much affected, but definitely a huge project, like trajectory to grow. And you know, what, what possibly would you be on the lookout for? So, um, yeah, interesting that you brought up because uh, there was, I, I published an article recently on my blog about um, uh, this company called Booking Holdings, which uh, my family owns shares of. Um, Booking Holdings is a online travel agent, the world's largest online travel agent. So naturally, you know, with COVID-19, there are fears that, um, or rather, uh, people have basically stopped traveling. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of uh, traveling plans that have been shelved or, 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 um, or, or, or cancelled. And this definitely has affected booking holdings. Uh, but I think, you know, if you look over the long run, um, as the world becomes more affluent, as the middle class uh, rises in, in numbers, there'll be more and more people uh, wanting to travel and fly. And I think this is a very strong tailwind for booking holdings. But not only that, right? You know, you're talking about the world's largest online travel agent. So um, it already has a very strong um, foothold in the online travel space. And online travel today, I think is about one third of like the total travel market. So there's again, in terms of like online travel itself, there's still room to grow. Um, so I think there are like two strong tailwinds uh, for, for booking holdings, even though it's actually facing some, um, some very strong short-term um, headwinds. Okay, okay. So booking holdings one of them. Okay, that's great. That's great. So mm-hmm. out of all of them, you chose the one with the strongest mode, I see. So yeah, fantastic example. I love it. Right, booking holdings. And one more thing, right? So next question is mm-hmm. this. Let's say, for example, right? Again, you know, who's to know what's going to happen? But, you know, in my personal point of view, um, just this is just my personal point of view. Even with the, even with the recent um, correction and the market being sold off quite a bit, I, I don't see valuations being extremely attractive as of yet, right? Uh, it's not exactly, uh, oh my goodness, dirt cheap, right? So, you know, I think the S&P 500, the P ratio of the entire S&P is still about 18 or 19 or something along those lines. And um, so let's just say, you know, this turns out to be something of a 08 crisis, right? Um, again, this is in the hypothetical world. Let's assume everything is, at avail- is available at a 50% discount. And you have limited capital and you put it in only three companies. Which three would be your picks? Um, I... I will never build a uh, portfolio with just three picks. <laughs> no, no. But if, if you were yeah, to yeah. just pick... Three. Yeah, yeah. If I were to answer like your hypothetical question, I yes. think one company would definitely be Berkshire Hathaway. Okay, um, fantastic. Through, through, yeah, through Berkshire, you know, you gain instant diversification and you also gain the services for nearly, uh, uh, of uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger mm. at um, very little cost. Buffett's mm. salary is $100,000 a year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Berkshire Hathaway definitely... Um, you want such company uh, and you know if I would and well and the other two would be really difficult um, of the, I think Amazon is probably a strong contender um, and then if I were to 
And then so now you have like two really like solid companies that are generating lots of free cash flow with very good track records of growth, good management teams, and still have like long runways for growth, right? So I think like the next one will perhaps be like a, a smaller company that's, that has the potential to like, I don't know, like 10x mm. or, or, or something. So I'll probably be looking at some smaller um, software, software service companies. Uh, I, it's, I can't really pinpoint uh, which one they would, but some of the the ones that I've been keeping keeping an eye on would be like um, Okta, DocuSign, uh, Shopify, uh, Twilio, Opterix, MongoDB. So so quite a number of these. Uh, they all serve different um, end markets. All have uh, different uses. Uh, um, and yeah, maybe to even throw in some really speculative one like Garden Health, uh, which does liquid biopsies. So biopsies are a um, it's a medical procedure of um, identifying the type of ca- types of cancer that's uh, in a patient's body. So traditional biopsies are actually actual surgeries where uh, uh, doctors have to um, reach into a body and, and extract cancer tissue. Uh, that's traditional biopsies. Liquid biopsies would actually be biopsies that are done through like your blood or some other bodily fluid. And through that, you can actually see... Um, or detect what types of cancer you have and that can help in terms of like uh, finding the, the, the proper uh, cost of treatment. Um, so, oh, can you give me a minute? Sure, for sure. Hey guys, I think the, yeah, let's resume. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so Garden Health makes this liquid biopsies and I think that, you know, it has a very uh, interesting uh, technology that could potentially uh, go on to 10x or 20x, uh, but it's super, super risky yet. Yeah, speculative, and I'm not even sure if I'll be investing in it myself, but like since you mentioned, you know, three companies and I already have mentioned two like really solid ones. So maybe, you know, you, you can, you, you have the support, the, uh, the strong foundation. So maybe you can just go on one that's like speculative. <laughs> okay, 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 cool. You know, you know, the surgery just to share with you, you know, the reason why mm-hmm. I, I asked the question was because, you know, in my personal point of view, I, Sometimes I, I like this approach of being like laser focused, right? Like, hey, um, mm-hmm. if I if I only to have like seven bullets, right, to actually like shoot, like what would I really really shoot at? You know, it's, it comes down to Warren Buffett's philosophy of, hey, you know, you don't have to shoot at every, you know, you don't have to swing at every single pitch, right? You know, you swing at the ones which are like you know really 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 solid ones, and you get take a blow, then you take a huge one, right? So you know, I like to think um, of investing in that way as well. So I you know I'm very very selective in my choices. Like hey, if it doesn't pass, let me throw it away. Let me throw it aside and really keep that laser focus. So it's interesting to hear what you have to say as well. So two really solid ones, and maybe one which is which could potentially ten x, but you know who knows, right? Yep. Okay, dude. Anyways, thanks for sharing. And Sergey, could you just tell us about where uh, our my followers, my all my friends can actually find your readings? Uh, your your stuff. Could you actually share about that a bit? Yeah. So I'm um I'm currently running this investment blog called the Investors. So our um URL will be the Good Investors SG. It's an investment blog that I run together with Jeremy Chia. It's a very much a passion project for the both of us. Uh, like our main um, this focus actually at the moment is to build an investment fund. Uh, we are looking at building an investment fund that uh with the with, with the key objectives of actually growing the wealth of Singapore investors. And also enriching society, so uh, that's our main like so-called commercial focus. Uh, and and the blog is really just a passion project. Jeremy and I believe deeply in investor education, um. So we are constantly publishing our thoughts and uh, and views about investing uh, on the blog. Uh, you know, we have no intention of uh, hiding anything or, or or monetizing anything. It's really a free personal investing blog to, to share. Uh, our unvarnished views on on the markets. So yeah, you just uh, feel free to to check out the blog and um, subscribe for updates. Dude, I just uh, just to wrap it up, I I just want to say mm-hmm. that Surging is really one of the best guys out there with regards to publishing stuff. He's been doing it for years. I don't think there's anybody else in Singapore has published as much stuff as him. I, I really don't know. Dude, like, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, me, I don't know. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never seen anybody else has published such good stuff. Like, you know, I've loved reading 
all that he has published over the years. It's absolutely a gem. Do yourselves a favor. Make sure you head down to a good investors. Check out everything he's written. Follow his, you know, follow his stuff. Go and read his book as well. I know he's written the book Investla. Amazing group, an amazing book, you know, with some other amazing investors as well. Anyway, Serging, thank you very much for being on the interview. I myself learned so much. I am sure my guys learned a lot as well. And uh, thank you for your views, man. Really, really appreciate this. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a, it's a real pleasure. Uh, I, I love talking about this. So thanks again for having me. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you.